Well, if you got your Bible, won't you grab your Bible? And uh, let's start off at Luke chapter 5. The scriptures we're, we're going to be looking at this morning, they're very familiar scriptures. What we've been endeavoring to do is just take scriptures that, that you know, you've heard, and help you just to kind of see it in a little bit different light. Um, or, or you could say just go up the mountain a, a different path, a different trail. We're going to the same place, but help you just maybe see things a little bit different. In Luke chapter 5, you find the story of Jesus and the paralyzed man. Anybody ever read that story, heard that story? I'll wait till I hear the pages stop turning. I need to stop to say, well, I'm in Texas, I can say turning. I've really been working on pronunciating my words, and but I, I'm, in, I'm in Texas. I'm actually born, born in Texas, bred in Texas, grew up in Texas. So I'm just like you. We think we're better than everybody else. I tell everybody in other states, we, didn't, we don't need you. We can secede whenever we want. We're our own country. We're, we're self-sufficient. We did the union a favor by joining. Luke chapter 5, verse 17, it says, It happened on a certain day as Jesus was teaching. There were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by who had come out of every town out of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Well, the power was there because Jesus was there. You know, if you were here, here last May, we, were here, we talked about the life of God, that Jesus was a a carrier of the life of God. He was a possessor of the life of God. He was a carrier of, of this, this healing power. Jesus showed up and the power's there. And behold, men brought on a bed a man who was paralyzed whom they sought to bring in and lay before him. When they could not find out how they could bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the housetop and let him down with his bed through the tiling into the midst before Jesus. I want you to know this, notice this. It says, when Jesus saw his faith, saw their faith, he said, man, your sins are forgiven you. Now, that's an interesting thing to say to someone who comes to a healing meeting. Can you imagine you're in need of healing? You go through all of this. They, they tear up the roof. They lower you down. And you're there for Jesus to say, you're healed. You're there for Jesus to say, rise up and walk. You're there for Jesus to spit on you and say, Shonda, you know, something. And Jesus looks and says, you're forgiven. In many ways, it kind of it could be a little insulting. Jesus says, "You're forgiven." Now you have to understand that, and, and I, we got a lot of a smart little Bible scholars in here. I mean, in the Jewish in the Jewish culture, they believed that if someone's sick, someone's diseased, or there's something physical, it's because somebody sinned. I mean, they had an understanding. We've got a covenant with God. As long as I do what I'm supposed to do. I'm staying under this covering and everything's fine. Now, it's not to say that everything was always a result of, of sin. You know, you have the man that was born blind. But remember, the first thing the disciples say was, hey, Jesus, who sinned? I mean, either mama, daddy, him, somebody had to do something. And Jesus let them know, hey, nobody sinned here. But then you have the man at the pool of Bethesda. Been there a long time. Gets healed, doesn't even know who Jesus is. Jesus finds him later on and says, hey, go and sin no more lest a worse thing come upon you. So, you know, it wasn't a hard line case of, hey, someone's sick because they sin. But Jesus understood this and he said, man, you're forgiven. You're forgiven. And what happened? Nothing. And it goes on to say, the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and said, Why are you reasoning in your hearts? Now notice this statement. Jesus said, Which one's easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Rise up and walk? Jesus said, Which one's easier? If you were to get a, an old-timey scale, you know, I've got one in my office and uh, Lacey got it for, for me for Christmas, and probably one of my favorite presents I've ever had. Wasn't even really expensive at all. I, I think she got it like 25 bucks on the Facebook Marketplace or something, but like I love it, and I wanted it just for this story because it, it's, it's really just radically changed my perspective on things. If you were to take a, you know, an old-timey scale 
and you were to put forgiveness on one side and healing on the other. Because Jesus said, which one's easier? Which one's easier? He said, which one's easier? If you were to put them on an old timey scale, put forgiveness on one side and healing on the other, they would sit there and balance each other out. They'd be the same. Now, if you were to ask the modern day Christian, well, not even modern day, all of Christendom for the last 2,000 years, if you were to ask them which one's easier, the Christian would say, well, forgiveness is easy. Healing is really hard. It would look like this in our perspective. That forgiveness is up here because it's easy, easy, easy. It's little bitty. And this healing thing is big, big, big. It's a big deal and it's really hard. And forgiveness, it just takes little faith. And because healing is a big thing, it takes big faith. It, it, it takes Texas-sized faith. And forgiveness takes little Rhode Island size faith, you know. <laughs> that's the way that we view it. Now, we don't want to admit it, but that's the way that we view it. And you know how I know that it's true? And you know it's true. Now, don't get mad at me. But you know it's true. Because when's the last time you got on Facebook and you said, I need everybody to be praying? Because my Aunt Susie, she sinned really bad. And I need everybody, I need your prayer groups at church, I need everybody to be praying. Spread the word. I need everyone to be praying that God would forgive Aunt Susie. Come on, in the church I was in, they'd say, well... When's the last time you saw that? Ain't Susie, she sinned bad. It's a big deal. I need everybody praying that God would heal. Ain't Susie. You've never seen that. You've never done that. Why? We see forgiveness as a, a little bitty, bitty, bitty deal. And yet, isn't it interesting that forgiveness is really the thing that's dealing with your eternity? But when's the last time you got on Facebook? And we're not talking about you. When's the last time one of your friends or one of your you just got on Facebook and scrolling through your newsfeed and you saw someone post, hey, I need everybody praying. Get your prayer groups praying. Everybody praying hard. Because Aunt Susie just got diagnosed with cancer. I need everybody praying that God would heal Aunt Susie. When's the last time? Like two seconds ago. You'll see it all over social media. Now, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not here to say one's right or wrong. I'm just saying I, I want us to kind of take a step back and really analyze what's going on in our minds, in our perception of things. Because think about it. Again, forgiveness of sin, you're really talking about something that deals with, with someone's eternity. Healing is just dealing with your body that's just temporary. And I'm not minimizing anyone's pain or, 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 you know, diagnosis or prognosis or anything like that. I'm not minimizing it. But what I'm trying to help us is, is to see properly. See according to the realities of heaven, not according to the realities of this world. But we see forgiveness as a little thing, but that's something that's affecting your eternity and your relationship and your fellowship with God. Your body is just a temporary thing. All it is is a tool for you to operate in this world. And you're going to get a new one. But the, but the thing that affects our, our eternity, our destiny, our fellowship with the Creator, our fellowship with the Father, we see it as something very, very small. And yet the thing that affects this body, we see it as something very, very big. And it's because we have magnified the body. And we have minimized who we are. You are a what? You're a spirit and you live in a body. So we've magnified a thing and we've minimized us. We've minimized who we are. We've made a natural thing to be a bigger deal than a spiritual. We've magnified it. And so that's why we magnify disease and make it a big, 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 big deal. When Jesus is saying, which one's easier? 
Come on, this wasn't your favorite TV, TV preacher. This isn't a denominational thing. Jesus is the one who said, which one's easier? Which one's harder? Forgiveness or healing? Jesus said they're the same. So, I mean, in this story, there are so many things we could pull out here. Number one, you see that forgiveness and healing, they're the same. They're the same. Number two, you, you find here that, that when you get forgiveness, you also get healing. You, you, you see that there is a, a divine relationship between forgiveness and healing all throughout the Bible. They're buddies. They're buddies. You know, growing up, did you ever, did you ever have some friends or maybe you had a best friend that wherever you were, they were? Anybody grow up in the, as a kid back in the, in the, the 80s and, you know, there was my buddy, my buddy, wherever he goes, wherever I go, he goes, my buddy, my buddy, my buddy and me. And then they had kid sister, kid sister, wherever I go, she goes. Well, forgiveness and healing, wherever one goes, you'll find the other. Come on, Psalm 103, verse 1 through 3. Bless the Lord, O my soul, forget not all his benefits, who forgives your sins and heals your disease. I mean, we, we could spend all morning just going through all of those. There's a wonderful relationship, and Jesus is bringing that out. A third thing, and we're not going to spend time on it this morning, but a third thing is what you see right here. Jesus said, which one's easier? Verse 24, notice he said, but that, so that you would know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Notice what Jesus said. So you would know that I have the power to forgive. I say to you, be healed. In other words, healing was supposed to be the proof of forgiveness. Or you could say healing was a proof of salvation. You know this to be true because it's in the Great Commission. Priestess, priestess gospel. Signs and wonders and miracles were follow. What's one of those signs and wonders and miracles? Speaking in tongues, casting out devils, you know, the serpent, the poison. And it's not talking about, you know, what CNN shows of the crazies in the mobile home playing with snakes and the drinking the poison Kool-Aid. You know, talk about people going out. You're out in these wild places. You don't have to work. You're protected. But so you see speaking in tongues, you see laying hands on the sick, healing, casting out devils. In other words, you see some physical stuff, some outward stuff to prove a spiritual truth. And it shows you where, again, where we are in the church and that we will very easily offer salvation, yet we're very hesitant to offer healing. Well, I mean, like, Jesus said, so you would know. Jesus said, so you would know I have the power, I have the authority to forgive. I'm telling you, be healed. Healing was proving forgiveness. Healing was proving forgiveness. You know, there's some people out there that just, they're going to have a hard time. Because think about it. Jesus said, go preach this gospel. This almost too good to be true news. That God loves you. He will forgive you. And just going beyond our, our, our normal understanding of forgiveness, that God will make you righteous. He'll make you right. That he'll unite himself with you so you could be just like him, have fellowship with him, and walk like him, and talk like him, and hear from him. This wonderful, almost too good to be true news. Jesus understood this gospel was so great, so marvelous, that there would have to be some signs and wonders and miracles. Rick Renner, great you know, Bible scholar, Greek scholar, he said that word signs, it means to literally authenticate the message and the messenger. Amen. And Jesus understood that you're dealing with carnal people out here. They're not spiritual. They're having a hard time understanding these things. Jesus said, I'm going to give you something to authenticate the message. So, so in reality, it almost kind of seems like Healing kind of should be easier than the forgiveness thing. That Jesus was giving you and I a tool to prove the gospel message. And yet look at the modern state of the church. We save healing for a back room. We, see, we, we save uh, you know, the baptism of the Holy Spirit for a back room. 
We don't want to offend anybody. The same things that we think are going to offend people are the very same tools Jesus gave us to win them. And you wonder why the church seems to be so lethargic, so spineless, so weak today, because we've taken the tools Jesus gave us to win the world and we've shoved them off in a back room for a special service when it's only believers. And yet what we're trying, endeavoring to do is that we get this and we understand this so well that we can use this like a tool, just like a mechanic uses his tools, that we are skillful and we are intentional with our supernatural equipment. There's been many times that, that I've been talking to people about Jesus and I could see it just ain't working. It just ain't happening. It's just not clicking. But I saw something physical going on. And I said, hey, let's deal with that. And what happens is they get healed. You know what it does? It opens up their heart. Jesus understood this. And he's telling you right here again in this story about the paralyzed man. So you would know that I have the authority, the power to forgive. I'm telling you, be healed. The healing was proven what he was telling him in the very beginning. It was a proof. But I want to spend time on this thing about, about, about healing and forgiveness. Being the same. That where you find one, you find the other. And you can see this in a... here. Before we go to this one scripture, turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. Pretty much all of you know this. I want you to see it again. This is kind of the, the, the mainstay, the foundation for which we go in everything, but especially in regards to healing. It's right here. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17 says what? If anyone is in Christ, any man in Christ, he's what? He's a brand new creature, brand new creation. All things have passed away. The old way of living is gone. A new life has begun. A new life has begun. If any man be where? In Christ. You get where? In Christ. You become brand new. That old way of living, that old way of thinking is supposed to go away and something brand new begins. A brand new way of living, a brand new way of life has begun. Well, what happened when you became a brand new creature, brand new creation? Well, verse 21 says, Jesus, who did what? Who knew no sin. He did what? He became sin. So Jesus, he didn't just take your sin. He did what? He became it. It became a part of his identity on that cross. He was sinless. He was perfect. But he not only took our sin. He became it. You know, if I take something from you, I can give it back. He became it. You, you see it in the Old Testament types and shadows when they would, the priest would put their hand on, on the, the lamb or the sheep, the goat, that it would become sin and they'd send it off, you know. Jesus became sin on that cross. And it says in the very way that Jesus became sin, you and I became the righteousness of God in Christ. We didn't just get righteousness. Yes, it's a gift, but it's not just something that I carry around like a special little trophy to put in my trophy case and say, look what God gave me. It's who I am. It's who I am. See, the sinner isn't just a sinner because they're sinning. They're a sinner because they're sin. You got to think about it a little bit. But why, why would they be a sinner? Why are they sinning? Because they are sin. You do what you are. You do what you are. They are sin. Because their spirit is connected to the curse. They're sin. But for you and I, Jesus, He came and He unplugged us from the curse. And He made us brand new and He plugged us into life. But it was righteousness. or you could, I like saying it like this. Rightness. Rightness. We became not just your rightness or our idea. No, the righteousness that God is and has. And the very way that God is right, He made you and I to be right just like Him. Now, this will not work in an argument with your spouse. I'm right. I'm right just like God. Shut up. That ain't going to work. 
when it comes to your fellowship with God, righteousness or the rightness of God, it not only affected your fellowship with God and that you can boldly go into the throne of grace to find grace and help in a time of need, you can boldly approach Him. It also affected your relationship against the curse, that you can boldly stand against the curse. You can boldly stand against the tumor. You can boldly stand against diabetes. You can boldly stand against a heart murmur. It not only affected your fellowship with God, it affected your relationship with the world. Righteousness, rightness. In the very same way that Jesus became sin, I became right. You became right. Now we have a hard time with that a lot of times because we're looking at this. Because we've magnified the body. We, we as Christians, faith people, we're still very fleshy. We're still very carnal. Because we look at this and we identify with this. This is why there's still racism in the church. Because we're looking at a skin color instead of looking at a spirit. We're not seeing them in the image of God and the rightness of God like they are. We're looking at this. And this is why we're struggling with healing because we're looking at this. We're body conscious. We're supposed to be God inside minded. We're supposed to be mindful and conscious of who I am, who I am. Not, not what I'm in, who I am. I am right. I'm the righteousness of God. Where? In Christ. It's not because of me. It's because who I got in and who got in me. And he made me perfect. He made me complete. Nothing missing. Nothing broken. Absolutely, magnificently perfect. He made me perfect. And that means there's nothing that I can do to change who I am. Yes, I may be working out my salvation. But even in my mess, I'm just like the Messiah. I'm just like him. I'm just like him. See, God didn't make a covenant with me. Because I would have screwed it up. It wasn't made with me. The blood of Jesus did this for me. He made me right. Or you could just very simply say it like this. He forgave me. He forgave me. He redeemed me. That sin that Adam committed, that, that started all of this mess. Jesus forgave me. He redeemed me from that, from, from the curse. And he brought me over. He translated me from the kingdom of darkness and he brought me over into the kingdom of light, his kingdom, because I was right. And because I was right, he could plug me into the life of God so it could flow unhindered, not only in my spirit, but also in my body and also through my body for other people. Come on, say it. I am the righteousness of God. I am the rightness of God. In Christ. In the very same way God is right, I am right. I know we have a hard time with that sometimes because we're looking at it from this. But think about it. How could I be united with a perfect, holy, complete God if I wasn't in the very same way? Come on. I can't be one with Christ and even have the minutest of a flaw. I'm telling you, I'm perfect. I mean, he's perfect. He's holy. He's complete. There, there, there's not one flaw about him. He cannot unite himself to something that has even the slightest, most minute little inkling of a flaw. That's how God sees you. Perfect. Right. He sees you as forgiven. He sees you as forgiven. He sees you as forgiven. Forgiven. Not because of what you've done or what you could try to do, because of the blood. He sees you as perfect. He sees you as perfect because he sees you in the blood. He sees the blood. He sees the blood. He sees the blood. Well, now let's look at a scripture that we all know. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. Now, if you were to ask someone, what does 1 Peter 2, 24 say? 
almost every single person would say, well, by the stripes of Jesus, we were healed. Wrong. There's more to it than that. But all we focused in on is that last portion of the verse. And in reality, you're going to see it. It's like, in reality, 1 Peter 2.24 really isn't a healing scripture. I mean, it is, but it really isn't. It's a righteousness scripture. It's a statement about righteousness. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. Hallelujah. I'm telling you guys, once you start seeing yourself as forgiven, once you start seeing yourself as righteous, see, righteousness, again, it's not something that you, you just have. It's who you are. Remember, before righteousness, you weren't just a sinner because you sinned. You were a sinner because you were sinned. You were sin. We're talking about your identity. We're talking about who do you identify with? What do you identify as? We should be identifying as right, righteous, complete. You know, Colossians chapter 2, verse 9 and 10, it says, Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. If we stopped right there, we'd say, praise God, hallelujah, praise Jesus. But he goes on to include you. And he says, you are complete, in Him. That means the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, and you in a body. I mean, this blows holes in the sacred cows of our theology that we're missing, that we're lacking, that we need more of this and we need more of that. We're waiting on God to give us something extra because we don't think we have enough. Why are we doing that? Because we're looking at this. We don't understand who we are. And so that's why 1 Peter 2.24 has been actually a place of frustration for people. Even in our faith circles. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, it says, Jesus, who himself bore our sins. He bore what? Sin. The sin thing. The sin problem. But remember, there's always a relationship. Sin and sickness and forgiveness and healing. There's always a relationship. See, what, what I've been really kind of going after is the science of divine healing. There's cause and effect. Now, I'm not saying that if you're sick or you've been going through some issues, it's because you sin. I'm not saying that at all. What we're talking about is the sin. The sin of Adam that released the curse into the world. There's cause and effect here. And he said, he bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we having done what? We having died to sin. Here it is that you were unplugged from the curse and you were plugged into life. You died to it. We're going to talk about this tonight more. But you died to sin. You died to sin. No, in other words, it no longer has authority over you. It no longer has power over you. And we've been real strong on that in the church that Satan can't make me sin. He can't make me do those things. I've got authority. I tell him what to do. We've been real strong on the sin thing. But remember, there's a relationship. Jesus said they're the same. And we understand that it was because of the sin of Adam that was the root that produced the fruit of depression, addiction, mental illness, mental disease, physical disease, all of these fruits but Jesus is telling us that I cut the root off. And when you cut the root, it stops all the fruit. And then he plugged you in over here and he created a new root. Oh, this is good right here. That I, he's the vine. I've never seen that before. He's the vine and I'm the branch. He said in John 15, verse four, five and six there, if you abide in me and I abide in you. Come on, I'm the vine, you're the branch. You will produce much fruit. In other words, there was a new root. You got rooted and grounded in him so new fruits would begin to sprout. And it had nothing to do with you. It was about what are you connected to? What are you connected with? What are you identifying with? Are you still identifying with the curse? I'm saved going to heaven, but I'm still living in the curse. Or are you identifying with the life of God that's supposed to flow on the inside of you because of righteousness, because of right standing, because of who I am? He said, we died to sin so we could do what? Live for righteousness. So we could live for righteousness. Well, I can't live for righteous if I'm not righteous. In other words, there, there would be fruits 
that would flow from me, from who I am. And then he goes, oh yeah, and by the way, and by his stripes you're healed. See, in other words, we've been focusing on the fruit and we forgot about the root from which it flows. See, you and I, we are, we are the branch from which the fruit flows from. But the branch isn't the one doing the work. It's the trunk. It's the roots that's doing the work. You and I were never designed to save ourselves. You and I were never designed to heal ourselves, deliver ourselves. I mean, I love what they were talking about in the announcements. It's not about you fixing yourself. The Holy Ghost on the inside of you fixing it. And what we've done, though, is we've been real strong in that area of the sin thing. But what we have done in the area of healing, we have separated healing from our union with Christ. We've separated it. We've been real strong in sin that Satan can't make me sin. He can't tell me what to do. He can't make me do anything. But then when it comes to the sickness thing, if you even start to hint at that, people get mad at you. Just say, who are you to say that, that, you know, I would let Satan make me sick? I'm telling you, Satan cannot make you sick. Do not get mad. Satan can't make you sick just like he can't make you sin. Unless you allow it. Don't get offended, but I'm telling you, if we've been doing something for a long time and it ain't working, it might be because maybe our thinking's wrong. Now, nobody would intentionally say, hey, Satan, give me all you got. I want it. I want it. I want it. Give me the cancer. Give me the diabetes. Give me the arthritis. I want it. I want it. No, many times it's happening just because we're not paying attention or we're so taken up with the busyness and the effects of life. We're going to talk about this tonight. I don't want to get too much in it. We're going to save it for tonight. But he's letting you know you died to that. By whose stripes you were healed. That healing would flow from that. That the roots and the trunk, they're doing all the work of getting the nutrients and the minerals and the vitamins and the juices and the water. And they're moving it all to the branch. And all the branch has to do is stay connected. Hallelujah. But what you and I have done is that we have, we have cut ourselves off from the trunk. And we're over here and we're trying to figure out the right thing to say and the right thing to do and all the steps and all the formulas, doing all these things to try to eh, squeak out some fruit. And that's why you say, what's 1 Peter 2, 24 say? Well, by the stripes of Jesus, I was healed. Yeah, but you're just focused on the fruit. And you weren't designed to really produce the fruit. The fruit comes from your position. The fruit comes from your union. The fruit comes from who you are. Are. Now think about this. So if before righteousness you were a sinner, not because necessarily you were sinning, but because you were sin. Well, then you became the righteousness of God. You became right. In other words, you could say, I am forgiven. It's a part of my identity. In other words, there was a change in my genetic makeup. Forgiven is who I am. Righteous is who I am. Well, remember, Jesus said forgiveness and healing, same. Sickness, disease, sin, same. If my identity is, is forgiven, if my identity is right, my identity is also healed. In other words, healing is not something I'm chasing after, it's something I am. Health is not something I'm chasing after, it's who I am. Because I'm right. It's, who I, it's a part of my DNA. It's a part of my new genetic makeup. It's a part of who I am. It's a part of who I am. I have healing flowing in my body because that's who I am. I can live righteously because it's who I am. You don't have to teach a dog how to bark. Because it's who he is. It's just a natural byproduct of who he is. Well, righteous living is a natural byproduct of a righteous person. It's just who you are. And so that's what I do. I'm no longer struggling with sin. It's who I am because I'm seeing myself in him. Well, then on the very same, same level, healing is not something I'm chasing after. It's not something I'm trying to get. It's not something I'm trying to produce. It's just a flow of who I am. It should be just, there's, yep, yep, there it is. 
It's just who I am. It's just what I do. It's the way that I live. That's why he said we died to sin so we could live for righteousness. It was Righteousness was uh, living was a flow of who I am. By whose stripes you were healed. And this is all throughout the New Testament. But we haven't preached healing right because we've separated it from our union. And we've taught it as something that I don't have that I'm trying to get. Even though the whole time I'm saying, but I believe by the stripes of Jesus I was healed. Do you, do you realize? Do you realize how kind of warped and twisted that is? I believe by the stripes of Jesus I was healed. Now, I, I need you to pray for me about my healing. Well, which one is it? I'm not, I'm not being condemning or anything. I'm, I'm making fun because I've been there, done that. I'm trying to get us to realize where we're, we've been at and what we're doing. We're, we're playing these faith games. It's why people go to the doctor. And I'm not saying, well, I'll just say this. I'm not, a, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a medical professional. This is my disclaimer. I'm not giving medical advice at all. Okay, there, done. So, but what I'm saying is, many of us, we go to the doctor. And, and, and the doctor gives you a bad report. And you walk away and you go tell your friends, well, I believe by the stripes of Jesus I was healed. But I want you all to be praying with me, you know, about, about this situation. Well, why would you need anybody to pray if you're already healed? I mean, think about it. I mean, I'm very common sense, just very black and white. And it's just really messing with me over the last couple of years because, you know, I'll sit in church and, and it's a healing service and they're talking about Jesus where he paid the price and healing's yours. And I, I believe that very much so. And that by the stripes of Jesus, you're already healed for 45 minutes. And then at the end, y'all come up here and receive your healing. Oh, wait a minute. You just told me for an hour that healing's already mine and I've already got it. Now you're telling me to come up here and get it. Which one is it? But that's what's being taught in our faith circles. Which one is it? I mean, a, a six-year-old can figure that out. Even my 13-year-old was sitting in the service. That was being taught. And he looked at my wife and he said, I'm confused. Which one is it? He said, Daddy ain't teaching that. Mama said, yeah, let's go. That's why we're getting out of here. <laughs> See, what we've done is we've taught it that healing is mine, but it's up there in heaven somewhere. It's kind of like it's in the bank. I just not, I need to figure out how to get God to withdraw it for me. But if it's a part of who I am, if it's a part of my union with Christ, I'm no longer chasing after it. I'm no longer trying to, to, you know, pull the lever and hope I win the jackpot on the fifth or sixth pull. You know, or confessing it long enough that all of a sudden, you know, I hit the lottery. Not doing all these things to try to make something happen and try to possess something that I know that's mine. I just don't have it in my possession. I mean, it's almost kind of like dangling the carrot in front of the horse. And what it's done is it's put us in a position where we've got this truth that, yes, Jesus paid the price for it. Yes, he became sin. Yes, he became sickness for us. And it's already been paid for. It's already been provided. But then there's been a disconnect. We disconnect from our union and we preach healing separated. And because we preach it separated, now I'm chasing after something Jesus already put on the inside of me. Let me show you some more scriptures. Romans chapter 8. I just want you to see that this, this connection between righteousness and healing, this connection of, of sin, sickness, healing, forgiveness. Romans chapter 8, phenomenal chapter. I know many, many, many of you have read these scriptures. Again, I'm very purposely using scriptures that you've seen before, you've heard, you've read about. Romans chapter 8 and in verse 10, he said, if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. But your spirit, says the spirit, he's talking about your spirit, not the Holy Spirit, your spirit is life. Remember, life is that Greek word zoe, the life of God, the life that God is, the life God has. He said, your spirit is life. Because of what? Righteousness. When you were made right, all that God is could now reside on the inside of you. And remember, last time I was here, we talked about this life. This is life was made to affect your body. Not, not just to affect your spirit, but also to affect your body. And, and Paul's proven this out right here. He said, your spirit is life because of righteousness. Because you're right. 
But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells where? In you. Come on, this is about being God inside minded. If he dwells in you, then he who raised Christ from the dead will also give what? Life to what? Your what body? Not the body when you get to heaven. Your mortal body will give life, this life that God is and has. He'll give this life to your mortal body through his spirit who dwells where? Not in heaven, dwells in you. See, we, we preach this in regards to sin and we preach this in regards to salvation. I'm the temple of God. God lives on the inside of me. But when it comes to healing, now we think he, he's back up there. And I've got to try to figure out how to get God here. Why is that? Because we preach healing separate from my standing in him. We preach it separate from my identity. We preach it as a possession instead of who I am. <laughs> Look, he said, as a result of that, therefore, what's the therefore, therefore? The therefore is the truth he just gave you. He said, your spirit, come on, he's not talking about the life in heaven. He said, in your spirit is life because of your position, because of who you are. You've got this wonderful spiritual substance on the inside of you because of who you are. And he said, that spirit, the same spirit, the spirit of God that lives on the inside of you, producing this life in this body. Come on, this is not me trying to get God to release it out of heaven. He tells us this wonderful redemptive reality. And he says, therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh. Not to live according to the flesh. This is why 1 Peter 2.24 has been a frustration for Christians, millions of them all around the world. That I'm saying, by the stripes of Jesus, I was healed. Now, why ain't it working? Because healing is a spiritual thing. Amen. If forgiveness is a spiritual thing, is it not? Amen. If forgiveness is a spiritual thing, healing has to be a spiritual thing too. Amen. Come on, Jesus said they're the same. It's a spiritual thing. It's a spiritual thing. In one sense, and please understand what I'm saying in this. In one sense, you could say it like this. All sickness is a sin in the body. I'm not saying you sin. I'm saying it's just sin in the body. It's sin manifest in the body. It's the curse manifest in the body. So Jesus said they're the same here. They're of equal weight. Not, no, none's harder than the other, easier than the other. Where you see one, you see the other. Think about it. When I sin, where does it really start? But then it's manifest out here. Spiritual manifest in the natural, the physical. Well, then what's healing? It's something spiritual that starts with a, an idea, a suggestion of a falsity, a lie of the devil with my imagination that we're going to talk about tonight. Starts here. It's a spiritual thing. And this thing right here determines whether what's in my spirit is going to flow into my body or not. It's a spiritual thing that's manifest in the flesh. That's why we, we quote 1 Spirit 2.24. Well, we quote the last half. By the stripes of Jesus, I was healed. But then I'm frustrated because I'm not seeing it. Because your focus is on the wrong place. You can say it like this. You're looking at the wrong warehouse. That healing power, that life, the source of it is not in your body. The source of it is you. Because now you're no longer sin. Now you are right. Now you are forgiven. Now you are healing. You are health. You're looking in the wrong warehouse to tell you if you have it or not. See, when I, when I was in... Uh, now, now remember, this is, this, is, this is kind of pre-Jesus day, so don't condemn me, but... When I was in college, I... Uh, I was working, I was doing some other jobs, wasn't making that great of money anyways. You know, you don't make that much doing these little minimum wage jobs. And, and my best friend, his, uh, his, his brother's girlfriend was the manager of Victoria's Secret. And so, you know, being a good little 20-year-old college boy, they were looking for some stock boys. I said, sign me up. <laughs> and so I worked at Victoria's Secret uh, during my, my junior year of college. Wasn't for the money. 
I was trying to get those digits, you know. But it took me about six weeks to convince all the women coming in that I wasn't gay because they're trying to figure out, why are you working in a lingerie store? Now, you know, 20 years prior ain't no big deal. But back then, I'm in there. And so my job was as a stock boy, I'd go into the warehouse. There was a big warehouse in the back. And we'd go to the warehouse when the trucks would come in. And we would take the items and bring them out there. And we did inventory and stuff like that. And yet, while I was doing inventory, you know, I knew everything that we had there in that warehouse. So much so that when I went out on the floor, which is where I tried to very quickly get out there, because that's, you know, where all the, the people were. And so... <laughs> And so I would try to be as helpful as I could. And, and so if someone was looking for something and it wasn't there, well, they might not think we, we don't have it anymore. And sometimes the girls that work the floor, they would tell them, we don't have that anymore. I'm so sorry. And I might overhear it and say, no, 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 it's okay. We do have that. You're just looking in the wrong place. This is not the warehouse. This is not the storage facility from which all of the products come from. Let me go back to where everything comes from and I'll bring it out for you. And many times I could go back out there and bring out the product that looked like it was missing, looked like we didn't have anymore. See, many times we're looking in the wrong warehouse to tell us if we have something spiritual or not. And I can prove this by scripture. Genesis chapter, chapter 3. What's going on in Genesis chapter 3, little Bible scholars? Okay, let's go back to first grade. Just <laughs> there we go. Somebody, somebody graduated. Genesis chapter 3. So Genesis chapter 1 and 2, you see creation. Genesis chapter 2, you know, he creates man. Genesis chapter 3, you see the serpent and Eve. Come on, some of you are already getting it. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. The serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we can eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it unless you will die. And the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open. Notice this, underline this, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. No, wait a minute. Jesus chapter 1, verse 26, God said, let's make man, let's make woman in our image and in our likeness. Let's make them to be like us. God said, let's make man, make woman to be like us. Let's make them in our image and our likeness. There's a reason that it tells us in the New Testament that Eve was the one that was deceived. Why? She didn't know who she was. Now, it's actually astounding when you think about it. I was just sitting here thinking about this before I came up. I never thought about it before. But, you know, this is before sin has happened. They don't know they're naked. We're in Texas. We say naked, you know. <laughs> Not naked. Naked. They don't know they're naked. Their clothing is the light and glory of God. And they're seeing God. They're talking to God. They're covered in light. But... He says, if you'll do this, you'll be like God. In other words, I know you're already like him, but I know you don't know that. So if I can just get you to do this. In other words, he was trying to get her to go after something she already was. It was the greatest deception in the Bible. And you know what? Why fix something that isn't broke? The devil is still pulling the same trick 6,000 years later. And it works every day. He is telling every single one of us, you're not healed. You're not healed. But if you'll do this, if you'll do that, if you'll do this, if you'll do that, you'll get your healing. He convinced Eve. Notice what it says. It says, when Eve saw, when she saw that the tree was good for food. We're not talking about your physical eyesight. She was already looking at it. We're talking about something that happened in her imagination, something that happened in her soul. Then all of a sudden, there was, there, was a, there was a change in perception. There was a paradigm shift there. All of a sudden, perception changed. She began to see that fruit differently than what she saw it before. What Satan was trying to do was to get her, get her to step out of the grace of which she was in and step over into works. 
Eve, when she saw that it was good, when she saw that it would make her like God, the great deception was she stepped out of grace into works to obtain something that she already had. And actually what happened was she lost what she had because she was trying to get it. And many of us, well, let's just say all of us, this is what is happening. When you begin to understand this life on the inside of your spirit, this life of God, righteousness put you in the position. The life of God became this wonderful possession on the inside of you, this healing power on the inside of you, which, which really, 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 it really, really is true that by the stripes of Jesus, you were healed. It's true. I know many of you have been frustrated with it, been mad about it. Say, I don't understand it. I, I see that it's true, but it doesn't look like it's working. I'm telling you, it's the truth. It is the truth that when he forgave you, he did heal you. Guys, listen to me when I say this. If God sees you as forgiven right now, and does he not? If he sees you as forgiven, he also sees you healed. Because that's who you are. It's not something I'm trying to get. It's who I am. I've got to start seeing myself the way God sees me instead of the way I see myself in the mirror. What I see in the mirror is not me. It's just a tool. It's just a car. It's just a carrier. But I've magnified this thing to be so great. But Satan's trying to get me to look out here. He doesn't want me to see who I am in Christ. He wants me to see who I am in and of myself. Because just like Peter walking on the water, as long as his eyes were on Jesus, he's doing the impossible. He's doing the supernatural. But all of a sudden, when he begins to look at the circumstances, now he's thinking about himself. Now he's thinking, oh, I can't walk on water during a storm. That's too hard. He begins to look at himself. And what happened? What he had, he lost because his focus was wrong. What Eve had, she lost because her focus was wrong. Her focus shifted. Her focus shifted. And then she lost what she actually had. And yet the sad thing was she was trying to get it and she didn't know she had it. And that's what's happening with us. We were unhooked from the curse, plugged into life. But the moment something tries to show up, I immediately look at here and say, oh, I guess I must have got sick. I got some sniffles. Guess I got the COVID, right? <laughs> and then what happens? In that moment, in that twinkling of an eye, that, that nanosecond of a sentence, I immediately plug into the curse. And I just lost out on the life that was flowing. And now I plugged into the curse. And now that begins to flow in my body. And yet many Christians get mad and say, God, why'd you do that? God, why won't you do something? God, why won't you heal me? He sees you as healed because he's looking at you as a spirit. He sees you as forgiven. He sees you as healed. You need to see yourself that way. And the moment you begin to see yourself for who you are, you immediately unplug from the curse and you plug back into life. You plug back in because now you see yourself as righteous right, the rightness of God, the forgiven of God. And if I am the forgiven of God, I have to be the healed of God. If Jesus is on the throne, he's there not only because I'm forgiven, he's also there because I'm healed. Friends, when Jesus was raised up out of the pit of hell, he did not come up until he had justified us. It wasn't because of him. He became the sin. He became the curse. He became the sickness and disease for us. God did not raise him up until he had satisfied our claims. When God saw us as righteous, as right, as good enough, that and in that moment is when he raised up Jesus and sat him at the right hand of God. Why? Because we were forgiven. And if we were forgiven, we were also healed. And that's why 1 Peter 2.24 says, we died to sin so we could live from, for righteousness, from righteousness. By his stripes, you were healed. It is a reality. It is a reality. But, but we've preached it separated. That's why when we go into the Gospels, we look at all those 19 individual cases of healing with Jesus, and we don't see ourselves as Jesus. We see ourselves as the woman with the issue of blood. 
We see ourselves as Jairus. We see ourselves as Lazarus. We see ourselves as the widow woman. We see ourselves as the blind man. We see ourselves as Bartimaeus. We see ourselves as a centurion servant. We see ourselves as Peter's mother-in-law. We see ourselves as the sinner. We see ourselves as the sinner. Separated from Jesus. Separated from God. Separated from the life. And, and because I see myself as a sinner, now I don't think I'm a sinner, I think I'm a good person, but my perception is that, that it's been preached separated, and I think it's a possession, something I'm trying to get, so now I've got to try to figure out how to get to him. It's the woman with the issue of blood. I'm telling you, that story right there, what was she doing? She's working, she's pressing, she's sweating, she's confessing. She's doing all these things just so she could get to Jesus to touch the hem of his garment and have that power flow out of him. That's how the sinners get healed. They have to get to him. But you and I. <laughs> you and I. You and I. Come on. I'm not separated from him. I'm not trying to press through the crowd and working my tail off, trying to make something happen. I got set free from that. I got unplugged from the curse. I'm no longer the sinner. I am the saint, the child of God, born of God, cleansed by the blood of the lamb, seated at the right hand of God. I got in Christ and Christ got in me and the same life that flows in him, it flows in me. I'm not working anymore. Come on, the Apostle Paul said, Galatians chapter 2, it's no longer I who lives. It's Christ who lives in me for the life that I live in this flesh. Come on. I live by faith in the Son of God who died and gave his life for me. I will not set aside the grace of God. I will not set aside the grace of God. I will not set aside the grace of God, but that's what we're doing. Many of us are calling it faith, but we're working our tails off for Faith Incorporated and not getting a paycheck. <laughs> we're working overtime and, and double shifts trying to get something. It's the simple message of the gospel. Christ in you, the hope and expectation of the glory of God. The glory of God where? In me. In me. In me. In me. In me. Come on, guys, when you get to heaven, there's going to be an unveiling. And I'm telling you, there's going to be some weeping and gnashing. Because people are going to see what was on the inside of them the entire time. It says it over there in the scripture, over in Romans, there's going to be a revealing. There's going to be a revealing of what was on the inside. All the people that think God is holding out, no. He filled you up to the full and overflowing Come on, when you got saved, there was a beep, 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 beep. Back it up. Back it up. And he got the whole U-Haul. And he emptied himself on the inside of your spirit. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3. He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. I am complete. I'm whole. Nothing missing. Nothing broken. Come on, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. The gift of God is life. Life. Look, this is why Paul said this in Romans chapter 8. Look, real quick. Where, where we left off in Romans, Romans chapter 8. And he's talking about the same spirit who raised Jesus from the dead, putting this life in your mortal body. He said, therefore, verse 12, therefore, brethren, we're debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. Look at verse 13. But because if you live according to the flesh, you're going to die. If you live according to the flesh, you're going to die. What was Eve doing? She's looking to the flesh to tell me about a spiritual truth. And what happened? She died. She died. She died. 
The wages of sin, the result of that, the result of the curse is death. The gift of God is life. Righteousness produces life. He said, therefore, we're not debtors according to the flesh to live according to the flesh. If you live according to the flesh, you'll die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. By the Spirit, these little things that try to flare up, if you'll kill it because of what's on the inside of you, he said, it'll die. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Friends, the Holy Spirit's trying to lead you not only in the plan of God for your life, He's also trying to lead you in the area of divine health. He's trying to lead you down this path, lead you down this road. This is why He says here in verse 14, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Verse 16, the Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. Joint heirs with Christ. The Holy Spirit every day, all day, is endeavoring to remind you, you're a spirit, you're a spirit, you're a spirit, you're a spirit. You're made in the image of God. You're made in the likeness of God. You're as righteous as He is. He's trying to make you spiritual. It's what Jesus was trying to do with Nicodemus. Jesus is trying to, to make Nicodemus a little spiritual. He's trying to tell him spiritual things. And Nicodemus, is, he's unsaved. He's a sinner. He's carnal and he's not getting it. But you and I as born again believers united with him. We, we, we've, we've preached the move of the Holy Spirit and being led by the Holy Spirit as far as the plan of God and, you know, and how to get set free from sin and all those type of things. But it also applies in this area. He's trying to help you to be spiritual, be spirit-minded, God-inside-minded. Because it's from this place that what you think you need flows. That's why he says right here in verse 18, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that will be revealed in us. He didn't say the glory that's going to be given to you. He said, the glory that's going to be revealed that was in you the whole time. But why is it there? Because Christ is there. Jesus said in John 17, when he's praying, his prayer up in the upper room before he went to the garden, he said, Father, I pray that they would be one just as we are one. That the world would know that you sent me. And Father, the same glory that you gave me, I have given it unto them. That, way we, that we would be one just as... Come on. You can't be in union with Him without having the same stuff. What was flowing out of Jesus for Lazarus and for the woman with the issue of blood and Peter's mother-in-law, that, that supreme divine healing power, that life of God that He was a possessor of, that was flowing through Him, it's in you right now. And you're not trying to get it. You're not trying to work for it. You're not trying to figure out the right lever and push the right button and turn the right knob. That's works. It gets you outside of the grace of God. It gets you outside of your position of Christ, your righteousness, and it puts you in the position of the sinner again, trying to figure out how to get him to do something. But isn't it interesting, you, you put it on the flip side, we're very confident in going and laying hands on somebody else for healing. But then when it comes to ourselves, then we preach separated again. When it comes to ministering to other people, we, we look at it with this divine connection. But then when it's me, I'm separated again. Now I got to try to figure out how to get it. But somehow, some way, some warped way, I've got it to give to somebody else. <laughs> Friends, it's the simple things. I mean, let's just be honest. There's some things, and some, I don't mean this to be sacrilegious, but there's some things you don't even need a Bible to figure out. It's just common sense. <laughs> if I can give you a quarter, it's because I have a quarter. And I can use it for me too. Friends, I'm telling you, you have it. Now, let me say this. I understand. We've all been there, done that. We've all had some situations where we're just struggling a little bit. 
and having a hard time making that connection. Thank God for the grace of God, the mercy of God, in which He's provided many, many avenues of mercy and help. And then if I'm struggling, thank God. I can go to someone else who has that same power only inside of them that I have. But because of the things of life, I'm just having a hard time. I can get them to lay hands on me and they can put what's in their spirit in my body. Now, it's the same stuff I have in my spirit. But maybe my soul is just, I need somebody to hook up with me and and give me a jolt. That's how much God loves you. So we've got that available. You've also got it available. You, you could take your hand and that what's in your, in your spirit, you could put that into a cloth and fill that thing up and put it on somebody's body and let what's, what was in your spirit get in that cloth and what was in that cloth get in their body. Amen. See, it's all about that spiritual substance getting in that body. So whether it comes out of your spirit, whether it comes out of somebody else's spirit, it's the same stuff. But the reason it's so important to understand that because what I'm trying to do is is help us get away from this thing of I think I've got to get to the man or the woman so I can get what Jesus already got me. Because if I'm always trying to get to somebody else to lay hands on me, it's going to be very hard for me to be in a position to give it away to somebody else. So I don't want it being all about Chad. I don't want it being all about you know, pastor or this person or that person. It needs to be about the believer. It's not about the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, the teacher. It's about the believer. It's about the new creation in Christ Jesus. That we've all been given the great commission. And we've all been given the tools. We've all been given the equipment. It's been placed on the inside of our spirit, but we see ourselves as carnal. We see ourselves as fleshy. And forgetting we're looking in the wrong warehouse. But like we said in the beginning, we should be so skilled and so proficient in this area. We, we could be like a master mechanic. And I want you to think about this. Your body really is no different than a car. But because we've magnified the body so much, we've magnified doctors too. If you're in the medical professional, I'm not, I'm not saying that. I got people in the medical profession, so don't get mad. I'm not saying anything condemning or anything like that. I'm just saying we've elevated the doctor because... This only really happens in America. You go to third world countries. uh, I was down in Colombia. Doctors get paid the same as an accountant. And there's, there's things behind that, you know, political stuff like that. But we've magnified the body. But think about it. When you go to the doctor, what are they really doing? I mean, you know, if you have a blood transfusion, they're just changing your oil. Somebody gets a transplant, they're just changing parts. Come on. Somebody has cancer, they go to the doctor, they cut the tumor out. Somebody welded a part. But think about it. We've magnified the body to such a degree. We go to the doctor, they change out a part, we call it a miracle. Got quiet in here. When's the last time you went to the mechanic? They changed out your radiator, your alternator, and you said, praise God, it's a miracle. (laughs) Come on. (laughs) When's the the last time a plumber came to your house and unclogged the pipe? You said, it's a miracle. (laughs) Things are flowing now. (laughs) Why? Because we're so desperate for the miraculous. We're willing to cling to anything that even remotely looks like it. But we've magnified this body to be such a great thing, in which it is. I mean, it's magnificent. But it's just a physical thing. It's just a body. It's just a body. It's just a body. It's just a car that allows you to get around and move in this this physical world. And if we would get the proper perspective, miracles would begin to flow and flow and flow. But what you see is big, you think it's going to take big faith. But I'm telling you, as we begin to make these things small, and we know this to be true because we've done that with various sicknesses and diseases. We think one's small and one's big. 
Somebody gets diagnosed with a cold, don't think anything about it. Nobody gets on there and says, please pray. We need, we need God to, to heal them. But then someone gets diagnosed with cancer, we need everybody praying. Why? We think it's big. We think it's big. We think it's big. But it's just small. If sin is sin, sickness is sickness. 